Uh, I hope you guys have had a good time so far. So I know this is the last day of the conference. The good news is that the first day CERN has told there's going to be a new edition of GreatConf next year. So be sure to come back. Um, so, well, the topic is Griffon, and then I feel compelled to ask how many people already know what Griffon is? Okay, so pretty much everybody. Uh, how many of you actually make use of Griffon for, for any reason? Maybe you're playing with it or you're actually making a, an application for your organization. Okay, so quite a few. Perfect. How many of you know there was a release made uh, 10 days ago? Okay, the, the other of you guys, well, you know there's a new release. So, okay. okay. Um, so, I have just one boring slide on my slide deck, and this is it. Well, no, that one. Yeah, so, uh, well, that's me. Uh, one particular thing about this is that, well, some of you know there is a book on topic which was uh, announced last year during GreatConf when we also released one other during GreatConf. Uh, that was a very, very big surprise. I have another small surprise. Well, as a matter of fact, I have the idea of showing you another surprise. You can see this t-shirt, right? This is an installed version of the Griffin logo as a Mexican wrestle, a mask. I already have a mask like this, but sadly, I couldn't bring it. So that was a surprise. Well, the next time we see each other, I will have a mask on, and maybe I'll have some additional masks to give away. Okay. Uh, there are some uh, stickers here, in case you want to take it afterwards. There are also uh, a few pins of the same mask logo and the Griffin logo, and there is one t-shirt to give away for the person that asks me the most difficult questions that I can answer. And I should warn you, I know what is the answer to life and universe. <laughs> well, of course, it has to be a, a question about Griffin, otherwise I don't know if I will be able to like, uh, oh, uh, if the group is going to be faster than Java, well, that guy already answered that uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, so again, that's the boring part. Let's go on with the, uh, with the show. Um, so to recap a little bit, last year we released 1.0 on stage. We also announced the, immediately ab the immediate availability of the Griffin in Action book. And since that time we have had uh, five releases since. Again, the last one, 1.3.0, was released 10 days ago, exactly 10 days ago. Um, we have, uh, so at the moment, 213 different plugins. We have seven archetypes. Does anybody know what an archetype is? Okay, so half of you. For the other half, Archetypes are a way for you to bootstrap or initialize the application structure in a different way. So think about Maven archetypes, exactly the same, but how do you initialize a project in a different way, but don't think about the ugliness of Maven. And that's pretty much it. Uh, we have two books, of course, there's Griffin in Action, and there's another one called uh, Beginning, Groovy, and Grass and Griffin, but Apress, uh, which has a chapter on Griffin. Uh, I took these measurements uh, 10 days ago, also closely. Uh, so far, we have had close to five, uh, 15, no, 50,000 plugin archetype downloads since the Artifact portal was released a year and a half ago. We also have another document, uh, we call it the usage test, which is going to show you in a little bit. Uh, and for that, we have had roughly 9,000 hits. This are, this is information coming from people that want to share how they are using Griffon for their own applications. Okay, so some of you have seen this before. This is the artifact portal that holds all the information on the uh, plugins and archetypes, the documentation for each particular plugin. This happens to be a Grails application too. This is open source code. You can clone it from GitHub, and this is how you can run your own personal por plugin portal for uh, maybe testing your own plugins. Now, keeping with the numbers, uh, 
We are now hosting the binaries at Bintray. Um, Bintray can give us very nice download statistics. We started hosting the binaries in February 4 of this year. The release was posted in January 11, so almost a month after those two things. Uh, since then, GUI 1.2 has been downloaded a little bit more than 2,800 times. I would say that is pretty significant. Before, uh, we didn't know exactly what was the size of the community. Now, I'm really surprised to see this number because usually do you don't hear people talking, hey, I'm building a desktop application as, as much as I'm building a mobile app or a desktop or, or a web app, right? But this number gives me a lot of confidence that there is a good number of people making use of this thing. Now, since we posted one tree again, remember, just 10 days ago, we have had 1,500 downloads. I think that the number is actually now uh, 1,600 since this number was posted uh, seven days ago. So it's quickly gaining ground on the other version. So many, many people have been upgraded to the latest release. Um, People often say that for open source projects like this one, a good uh, another good number of measurement is how many bugs reports you get. This is what we have at the moment. Out of all the uh, the old bugs, I think that the number, the current number of bugs is 638 currently open. We have closed 87 percent of them, so we have done a pretty good job of of, of um, sorry, of um, listening to you guys whenever you encounter a problem and try to fix it as soon as possible. Now, another thing that we can see based on plugin downloads and user statistics is which is the target Java version you're using. Now, you will see something funny here. If you take into account only the information coming from the plugin downloads, looks like JDK 6 is the most commonly used JDK. But based on the information that people have decided to share directly with us, JDK 7 is now the JDK of choice. Uh, we're hoping that after, what is it, uh, Russell, April 1st, maybe? It's a, it's a funny date. <laughs> Close to April 1st, JDK 8 will be finally released. We hope that number we're going to jump immediately into JDK 8. Now, what about operating version, oper operating systems? You see the type of machine I'm using. I'm also a, a Linux freak. I really don't like to work on Windows. There are so many variables to make it go wrong. It, that, that, yeah, you know how it is. So, in case of plugin downloads, half of them are done using a Linux system. Surprising. But in the case of people that want to share information directly with us, more than half of it is on Windows. Which means that more, pe more developers are testing directly on Windows and this is probably some kind of si uh, continuous integration server building the application. So if we, this means that if we receive a bug report that something doesn't work quite well on Windows, then we have to pay more attention to it. Sadly, that is the case. Yeah, Windows. Okay, another thing is uh, where in the world is Griffon being used? How big is the community? Based on the plugin downloads, 86 different countries around the world make use of Python. That is pretty good. Number one is United States. The second one is China. The third one is Germany. Denmark is in the 11th place. So all you guys now have one job. You have to make sure that that number keeps going up. Yep, awesome. You see, there is South Africa right there. Uh, Whereas if we just count the information that people are sharing with us, we only have 17 countries. Now, if you see your home country right there in white, then please let us know about you and your usage. Now, here, again, United States is number one, China is number two, there is Germany, and I think that number four is Indonesia, which is surprising. Well, at least surprising to me. I, I didn't expect people from Indonesia to be uh, up front. Okay, 
So this is enough of the, uh, the numbers. Let's get into some of the new things that were added to the framework. Uh, all right. So we have added features both at the build time level and at the runtime level. Now, on the build time level, perhaps the, the most uh, useful one is that we have uh, upgraded most of the dependencies, one of them being, of course, the usage of Groovy 2.0. With you know that with Groovy 2.0, you're going to have access to a statically compiled Groovy, which has been proved to be much faster than dynamic Groovy. And there are definitely some other new features like module extensions. Does anybody know what a module extension is? Yeah, of course, because you created it. So you guys know that for the Java YouTube list class, you have an additional number of methods like each, collect, inject, and whatnot. This is called the, JDK, the GDK, the Groovy uh, Development Kit. Now, these methods are added at some point by the Groovy runtime. Now, what module extensions allow you to do is to define methods in such a way that they get added to classes as if they were coming from the standard GDK. So this is really good. Besides, these methods are visible to a statically compiled Groovy code. Am I right? OK, so this is one very exciting feature that you can have access in Groovy 2. And there are uh, four plugins at the moment that make use of this feature. OK, uh, there are many, definitely many other things that you can do with Groovy 2.0. Uh, I think that we are relying on the latest release, Groovy 2.1.3, the latest stable one. OK, so we are right there. Mm. We know that no man is an island, so we support team-friendly configuration. What does this mean? I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, we have additional commands. We have much more commands than Rails. And uh, we also have a new, uh, an additional thing that happens when uninstalling independent plugins, and I will explain that in a moment. So, team friendly configuration. Uh, you know that if you want to define uh, a few flags that affect how the application is built, you put those things into buildconfig.groovy. This is a file that is usually uh, stored in source control. So, whenever you change that file, you will affect your teammates. If you want to have some configuration that is not checked into source control, what you do is you make use of this file, uh, userhome.grayphone.settings.ruby. Uh, actually, I think there should be a version number right there. Yeah, I'm missing that. It's an error in the slides. Uh, this is a global configuration file. So whatever information you put in that file will affect only your projects, with all of your projects. And that's a little bit of a problem. Why do you want to have configuration that only affects this project, but not the other ones? And this is exactly what this feature is doing for you. So what you see here, this is a, a flag that affects all projects. This means that whenever you run the Gryphon command, you will see a lot of verbose output. But if you use this uh, like a small DSL, uh, you have to have this node project, and then follow it up with the name of the project you want to change, then I can say that for this particular project, the sample one, this flag will be false. Uh, every other project will be true. For the legacy project, that is the name of the application that you see in application of the properties, then this flag will be true. That's pretty cool. Now, we took uh, inspiration of this based on the job that Russell did for the Groovy effects build. So we keep uh, finding information on the other Groovy projects in the Groovy ecosystem and see what we can uh, steal and borrow from them. So thank you, Russell, for the inspiration. Uh, some additional commands. Uh, you know that you can create artifacts based on templates, but you didn't know exactly which templates were available to you. Now you have that. You just do Gryphon list templates. You can see all the templates provided by the default distribution and all other plugins. Uh, you can also upload a release. What is a release? When you create a plugin, you package it as a zip file. Now, this is a package release. 
you can do later a uh, Griffon install plugin and give it the, the, the path to that zip, right? But a release is another type of zip file that contains the package plus some metadata. This is the zip file that is published into an artifact repository. Now, what we didn't have prior to this is the ability to download a uh, plugin release from a repository and relocate it to another plugin repository. This command allows us to do precisely just that. We also have the wrapper command, bless you. When, the, when you create a new, com new application, you get the, the Griffon wrapper uh, files, but if you delete those files, there was no way to get them back. The wrapper command will always create these files for you with the latest versions or update the, uh, the number version for you. We have the user stats. This is the command that will allow you to send us information whenever you run Gryphon. Doesn't matter in which way, whether you use the Gryphon command, the Gryphon shell, uh, running within an ID like IDEA, or using the Gradle uh, uh, integration. Finally, the plugins dependency report. So I'm going to show a few screenshots of these commands so that you see what is new. Now, this is a screenshot of the output of the list templates uh, command. You see here are the standard ones from the default archetype. These are the ones coming from Swing. So Swing is the one that defines the view. That, that is how you uh, see when you create a new application, you get a standard view that says application, and inside that is a label node. Well, this is the guy that does precisely that. And this template is different based on the uh, plugin token that you're making use of at the moment. So it may be Swing, it may be JavaFX, it may be SWT, it may be something else. Now you see some other things here. So there are some other plugins that provide additional templates. And you can also have templates written in different languages. Because you know, you can write a Gryphon application with Groovy or Java or Scala or any other of the nine different languages that we support. Now here's another command that if you have used Gradle before, looks very similar. Uh, now we have a dependency graph for all the plugins. Not only can you see, well, my application depends on the CSS Builder plugin, but I know that that particular plugin has a transitive dependency to the Swing 1.2 version plugin. And I know that this plugin has been downloaded for my local Gryphon artifact repository, whereas this plugin does not exist locally, and if I need to download it, it will be downloaded from that repository. So this, again, goes, goes to help you with reproducible builds so that you know what things are coming from where. Here's another example of a of, uh, Gradle-like report on the command line showing you all the dependencies for the runtime configuration. We have this report as a nice HTML and XML file, but you can also get them on the command line. Now, those of you that have used Grails 2.2 and Grails 2.3 have seen these too. We saw that Grails added this feature and we decided to copy it as well. Now, on installing plugins, uh, there, there is, it's, a, it's possible for a plugin to have other transitive dependencies to other plugins. And if you install the parent one, the transitive will install. Sometimes this is good. Sometimes this is bad. So what we now have is the ability to uninstall a plugin plus all of its dependent plugins. You also have the ability to uh, get a report of what is going to be uninstalled but do not do anything. So don't touch the configuration. I just want to know what is going to happen if I actually want to run this operation. Yeah, question. So the question is, do we handle optional dependencies? Uh, in this case, it's all or nothing. But there is a catch. And I'm going to show you this example. Say, so let's see. Uh, in this report, see, this is a nice thing to have this graph. So now I can follow with the example is that, let's see, Dialogs plugin has a dependency on place list, which has a dependency on swing, and there's also meek layout. Okay, this is the important one. Look and feel has a dependency on meek layout. And look and feel meta Yuya.
stop playing with this thing, right? Okay, so you can see mid layout is here and there, and look and feel is here as a standalone thing and also as a dependent here. If now I decide to uninstall the Dialogs plugin with all of its dependencies, that means uninstalling Glacelist and uninstalling mid layout. Well, if I do so, I will install Dialogs, I will install Glacelist, but mid layout will still be kept. Why? Because it is required by look and feel. But if I uninstall, let's say, mid layout directly, then, well, of course, these two will, be, will not work correctly, but that's exactly what I wanted to do. Maybe I was upgrading a different version. But for plugins that are dependent, and there are some other guys dependent on exactly that one, more than one, then it will not be uninstalled. So I guess, will that answer your question? All right. So what I'm going to do with an example is uninstall this guy. Or at least generate a report. What's going to happen if I try to uninstall this guy? Look and feel meta UV. If I do it in the regular way, notice that it's this new addition, this new flag, right run equals true. Then I get a report of all the plugins that are going to be uninstalled. Just that one. That means all of these dependent plugins will still be left hanging in my application configuration which may be or may not be a good idea. But if I use the force flag, then I will uninstall this guy, but notice that its other dependent plugins will also be uninstalled. So far so good? Perfect. Uh, I think that this sums, there are a few other build time capabilities that have been added to core, but I guess these are pretty much uh, the most exciting ones. Uh, there are some other runtime features that we have added since. Uh, messages and internationalization. We had a plugin before called the internationalization plugin. Now we have added this feature directly into core. So every Gryphon application is now internationalization aware. Uh, I guess that, that is pretty good, particularly for me, because English is not my native language, and I can write my own applications in my own native language, which is Spanish, by the way. Uh, resource resolution and resource injection, this is pretty cool. There are a couple of plugins making use of this guy. Uh, service configuration DSL, we will see that. Controller actions and action interceptors, the last one comes from the latest release 130. We will see a pretty cool example of that. So messages and internationalization. That is pretty much resolving uh, messages defining resource bundles. Uh, so the API is quite simple. You give it a key. If that message is not found, you will get an exception, no such message found exception, which is okay. Or if you give it a default value, then you will get this, this result. If no value is, if no key is configured, you get no exception. You can also pass in arguments to be resolved for those messages. So what you configure in a properties file, say this is the standard way to do it in, in Java, right? You see uh, braces and an index. Well, we also added this other syntax. This looks a little bit like Ruby symbols. What happens is that when here we either accept a list or an object array of arguments, and for here we accept a map. So notice how we're making use of those, uh, those two keys. We, can all, we also support, instead of writing properties files, you can write Groovy scripts, you know, because uh, there is this uh, class called Groovy uh, property sloper, and that creates com config objects. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, there are some other new uh, features related to internationalization, but this is pretty much the, the gist of it. Uh, related to internationalization, we have resource resolution that works pretty much exactly like internationalization, but there is a cache. The result, the returning object of this method call may be object. For the other guy, it has to be a string. We are resolving messages on the other guy. For this, we may be resolving something else. So what this example is doing, this defines a path to an icon. And when I invoke this method, the result will be an image icon object. It will not be a string. How do we do this? By finding the proper matching property editor. 
So if on the other side here we have uh, we are assigning a property of type image or image icon, the output here will be of the right type using those property editors. That's pretty cool. There's also a feature for you to register your own custom property editors if you don't like the default ones. And we have we pretty much cover all the, the our bases with the uh, the swing classes that require this kind of classes. Yeah, color, image, uh, gradient, uh, icons, and uh, files, URLs, and all the primitives. We also have resource injection. So if we are able to resolve resources, we also would like to inject those resources. Let's say that in a properties file, we define these two keys. These are, this is, this is just regular text, and there is a representation of the red color and on the, an extended format without alpha, and this is the short format for the white color. Okay? So now we define this class, and we make use of this annotation. This is not an AST transformation, this is just a regular annotation, which is great, because if, as it's not an AST transformation, this can be applied to Groovy code or Java code. If I were to rewrite this thing with uh, ugly semicolons and put the public modifiers and maybe private here, yeah, making it uh, ugly Java code, this thing will still work as is. Okay, so what we're doing here, uh, we're making, uh, we're, uh, we're taking again uh, advantage of convention over configuration. Notice the names of the keys. Sample, sample model, so this is the full qualified class name for this guy, and then the property. Notice that an injected resource for that property that matches that name, so package, class name, property name, by right there, there's nothing else to be added. Whereas this other guy we're saying for this property, we would like to match it to this particular key. And that's it. When the, the Griffon application bootstraps itself, it will locate these resource files and locate this key and transform this string into a color instance and set it as the value for this property. That's pretty cool. Um, the questions, Fab? No? There is a plugin called the theme plugin that makes use of this property, uh, actually this feature, and you can even change the theme while the application is running, which means you have to reevaluate all the resources and re-inject them, but only on those places where injected resource is defined. That's pretty cool. Here's another feature that we have added, the service configuration DSL. On one side, we have a service definition. Say that we have a server class that will, I don't know, is HTTP or something else, whatever, it's just a server that requires two properties host and port, I will make use of that property inside the service. Now we need those two properties to be defined somewhere. Maybe they come from the application configuration, maybe the user in, uh, types in those inf that information, but I don't know. So when the time comes for connect, we have to create a server instance with those two values. Now by default, we may have some values defined in the application configuration. How? This is where we added this piece of code is added into the config.groovy file. We use another kind of DSL. The, node, the top node has to be services. Then we give it the matching name. This is network, so that is network service. There we go. And then we define the properties. So when the application bootstraps and the service instance is created for the first time, again, services are treated like singletons, then we, we find the matching configuration and apply it right there in those two properties. And that's it. This is uh, a no. Uh, so this is quite simple. If you make use of Spring, maybe you set the, the configuration in a different way, like the regular Spring way. But this is also friendly with the Spring. Even if you use the Spring plugin, you may define these properties with this DSL. It doesn't get in the way. I'll say that there are other features that I would like to show. Uh, controller actions, you may have seen them before. I think they made a debut in Groovy 110. And action interceptors that were added just recently. And for that, I'm going to show you some live code. And remember, 
if it's if it's not live, then it will not crash. So I'm hoping that be the case that we will not have any crashes. So let's see. Let's switch for a moment. Uh, it will take one more second. Perfect. I will run the application first, and I'll show you quickly what's going on with the code. So Griffon, I will show you that is uh, Griffon one three zero. Yeah. In case you didn't know, whenever you want to define a bug report, just run Griffon dash version. I will give you this output, which we also copied from Gradle. All right. Griffon run app. There is a significance for that particular date. Some of you may know. Okay, here's an application. It's quite simple. It's just a frame with three buttons. Let's see what happens if I click um, logout. Oh, insufficient security clearance. If I try to click on printer. Insufficient, insufficient security clearance, okay. What happens if I click on login? So this is an application that makes use of some security measures. If on, only if I log in, I can actually invoke the print action. Otherwise, I get that error. So let's log in first. You click on login, and you get this dialog. And uh, let's see, if I just click OK here, I get that. Notice there are some errors printed in the console. If I hover here, I should get a tooltip. And this gets uh, this change color to red, and we get a nice overlay icon right there. Let's put some text here. Click OK again. Now, the overlay has changed to green, but this is still wrong. Let's put something else here, like, I don't know, some bogus uh, login. And that, that was the password that I, was confi that I configured. So let's put a new, uh, the good one. Yeah, you should always be root. There we go. Uh, we are inside, and now I can print as many times as I want to. If I do log out, well, if I try to log in again, I'm already logged in, right? I get a different error. OK, so let's, let's log out, try to print again. And we have a problem. Now, for this to work, let's see. Um, here we go. We're making this is a very simple trivial application. We're making use of a lot of plugins. There is this guy that I'm going to talk about in just a moment domain plugin, Glacely, that generates this table. Uh, we're making use of Java time related to scaffolding, MIC layout, JS layers, how we put the overlays on the text field. Uh, Shiro, this is Apache Shiro, that is the security plugin, making use of this new feature called Action Interceptors. That's exactly what we're going to see in the code. All right. So let's see the code for that in the controller. Here we have the printer action, login action, and logout action. Notice that those three actions make use of an annotation. This is an annotation again. This is not an AT transformation, so I can rewrite this code in Java, and it will still continue to work. What the action interceptor does for you is uh, this action interceptor will be invoked before uh, one of these actions get executed by the framework. You may abort the full execution of the action, or you may continue. And after the action has been run, then you can also do uh, run your own custom code. So in particular, the Shiro plugin registers um, an action interceptor that matches this configuration to the action name. And if so happens that there is a currently login user whose permissions match this set of permissions, then this action will be run. Notice that login requires a guest, which means you don't have to, you cannot be authorized, whereas logout requires authentication, so you must be already logged in. That's why if I click login, then I somehow this will pop up a window, we'll see that what's going on here. And if I try to log in again, which and I'm already logged in, then this is the condition that will make it fail. 
Now, here's another thing that you'll see with this action definition. What is this guy? That is, uh, that's some other argument. Who creates this guy? Well, that is another action interceptor. This action interceptor comes from the scaffolding plugin. Uh, let's have a look at that login command object. Does that look familiar to you, the Rails users? This is exactly like a command object from Rails, right? Turns out that the framework, this, that particular action interceptor, is aware of this type of objects, command objects. And whenever it sees one, it will automatically generate a dialog based on this information and these constraints. That dialog that you saw with username and password, okay, I cancel, I didn't create it. It was dynamically created by the plugin based on templates. And you can override all those templates. If I go back to the command line, I think that the command for showing all these scaffolding templates is a list uh, scaffolding templates. I should do it. Let's see if that is true. Or is it install? Uh, yeah, it's probably install. Uh, yeah, that didn't do it. So let's try another one. Uh, this install, I think that is, that is the name of the command. Zip. Whoa, yeah, I actually saw all the templates. Okay, uh, let's put list. There we go. This should do it. I just want to see them, though I already copied them to my application. Okay. There we go. These are all the different templates provided by this plugin. You can override all of them in, in, in a very smart way. Uh, notice here, these ones are related to Jola time, minutes, months, and years, and weeks, because the scaffolding plugin will be, and the domain plugin will be the basis for bringing GORM into Gryphon. And because you're working with dates, we know that Java util date and Java use SQL date are really, really bad. You should be using Jola time if you are stuck with JDK 7 or less. If you're using JDK 8, you use JSR 3.10, and that's it. So when JDK 8 gets fully released, we will upgrade this template so that you may use Java time or use JSR 3.10. And yes, and, and, and Stephen will be happy. OK, so uh, what, what really makes me happy about these particular features is that notice how concise the code is. You just have to define what a command object is, and I just take the power, make use of the power of templates. And on the controller side, just annotate these things with the, uh, the correct settings, given that there will be an action interceptor doing the, the work for you. Now, there may be some other action interceptors in the future. Imagine yourself uh, that this action will have, uh, if you want to have a transaction applied to that action, just put at transactional on top of it. And magically, a transaction will be created whenever you invoke that action. And it will be commit when the action gets uh, executed at the, well, once you finish here, or will be rollback if any exception happens. Is it cool? This is exactly what happens with Grails and filters. Now we, na we have that power in Gryphon with just a different name for, for the feature. Um, speaking of transactional, uh, the guys at the Hacker Garden two days ago made sure to add, add transaction as an AC transformation to Grails. That's pretty cool. Um, OK. One well, another thing that I have to mention about this particular plugin is that it's toolkit agnostic. I have the same application running in JavaFX. The controller code is exactly the same except this guy, because here we see swing. In JavaFX, there is another way to display dialogs. But the code has nothing to do with the UI whatsoever. So the security and scaffolding works exactly the same whether you want to use Swing, JavaFX, or some other the support toolkit. That's pretty cool. Question? OK, is there any reason why here this is a method and this is an action? Yes, to show you 
that both syntaxes are supported. It doesn't matter if you use method or a closure, you can annotate them and the action interceptor will do the right thing. Um, notice also the names that we have here. You saw that the, the uh, buttons have a specific name. And if I run the application again, uh, that will be uh, GA. I have my own aliases, so I don't have to keep typing a lot. So G is an alias for Griffon, A is an alias for app, which extends up to run app, so GA is run app. You see that, app .ruby. Anyway, so you see in a moment, again, those three buttons, but in the top, here we have this menu. So let's put that together, so you see them neck to neck. These names are important. And notice the actions here. Right? I didn't specify this information on the controller. I, however, specified this information coming from resource bundles. Yeah. Here are my actions. So following again a convention, I could use the full qualifier name of the controller, or I could use this other type, application.action login name. This will be the name that is appearing on the button, uh, the mnemonic accelerator and short descriptor. With, without changing the, um, okay, let's, let's close this one. Let's, let's change this thing to something like, I don't know, something silly, login, login, and run the application once more. And you'll see that the name of the button is different. So now you don't need to change the code, you just change properties files. And because these are fully internationalized aware, I can create a Danish version of this file, or a German version, a Spanish version, and just stick it into my source code, and that's it. See? Login, login now. As easy as that. Perfect. I have another example that I want to show you. Uh, you, you, some of you were probably yesterday at Stephen's uh, talk on Groovy FX. Well, Groovy FX, for those, uh, no, yeah, Groovy FX. For those of you who don't know, it's a kind of like a uh, DSL on top of JavaFX that makes use of Groovy, of course. So that way you can write JavaFX in, what would be the correct way to say, Russell, in, in the same way to write JavaFX? Yeah, that's perfectly good. So what we created at the Kaka Garden two days ago was a small application for uh, running ASCII data. And this is done with JavaFX. Why? There is one particular reason. You can transform ASCII doc sources into HTML. Can you tell me which is the best way to visualize HTML? What is the type of component that we use every single day to uh, see HTML? A browser. WebKit. Do you have access to such kind of component in Swing? Not really, but you have one in JavaFX. And that's exactly what we have here. On the left side, we have a simple text area with some ASCII doc source. And on the right side, here we have a WebKit view from uh, JavaFX. The moment that I click Convert here, I see the output is the right HTML. And here we have the correct HTML with some uh, uh, style sheet. This took us uh, um, roughly two hours with a little bit of tinkering and finding out what were the correct names for, for JavaFX and GroovyFX. But I, and I, I was helping the guys. And the guys that did it, they didn't know nothing about Gryphon, nothing about JavaFX. And still were able to do the job in, on, in under two hours. That's pretty cool, I would say. If you were to do this in the standard Java route, mm, it will take you, what, weeks, maybe? So, yeah, pretty cool. Okay, I'm almost running out of time. We have five more minutes. So what's next for, for Griffin? Come on. There we go. That was the demo. Hey, we didn't have any crashes. Pretty good. Uh, so what's next? Uh, some people complain that they cannot use Gryphon in, a, in their IDE? It depends. IntelliJ IDEA has the best support for Gryphon so far. 
there is one particular problem with the dependencies. If you set up the Gryphon application from within the IDE, if you call the command line Gryphon integrate with IntelliJ IDEA, you get the right dependencies. But you have to regenerate the files every single time. So what we want to have is everything inside the IDE. Uh, that will happen. Uh, also, uh, NetBeans, there is a plugin for Gryphon that has the same problem. The dependencies are not recalculated at the time that they should be. We will fix that. Uh, Eclipse, Eclipse STS is now open source since last year. So we're looking for volunteers. If anybody here is a fan of Eclipse, for helping us transform and translate Grails STS into Gryphon STS. Uh, domain class support, you just got a glimpse with the scaffolding. What we need to do now, we already have finders, dynamic finders. We already have static uh, methods added to domain classes. It already works. But we're doing it in such a way that we not only support Hibernate, but we support other persistent options. Because you know there's SQL and no SQL. Yes, we will have a Neo4j option. It's already in the works. Uh, yeah, sadly, I have to say MongoDB as well. But we'll make sure that Neo4j will be the first one. Uh, and many other persistent options, so that in the end, it doesn't matter which persistent option you make use, the API is quite consistent. Uh, we will be adding more plugins. Ah, yeah, of course, this has to do with scaffolding and templates and whatnot. We will be uh, creating more plugins for you. And uh, uh, correct me if I, if I can see it, Niels, Niels is right here in front of you. He's working on the Maven support for Gryphon, which uh, is still in the experimental space. I know, but some people, I, I just received a, an email uh, yesterday night. Somebody wants to run Gryphon using Maven. What can you do? If, if, if there are enough people asking for that feature, then we have to figure out a way to do it. And Niels is helping us get into to that goal. So thank you, Neil. And of course, the uh, what else can you do with any particular open source project? Just add more cowbell. OK? So if you have guys have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I think we have a couple of minutes before we go into the recess, into the break. Otherwise, uh, just, just feel free to grab me at any time. We'll still be here for the whole day. And remember, if you want to have this t-shirt, you have to ask me the most difficult question about Gryphon. Uh, you, you can, can put, put it at the class, class level. level. Say that you, you can, can, if I go back here to this, uh, the code base, to the controller, I can put requires authentication at the class level. So now, action you define must have a subject register with the Shiro. Now, the Shiro plugin also allows you to configure the security realms in different ways. I'm using the default one, which is based on properties. But uh, as opposed to the Shiro plugin that from Rails that uh, assumes that your realm comes from the database, this one does not. This one will allow you to create a security realm any way you see fit. But of course, it comes with a default. And yeah, the default is right there, it's just the properties file. So I know that that's why it's the password root and root. Now you see, oh, now you can hack this application. Any other questions? Yes. So the question is, are we ever going to move to Gradle instead of Gantt? Because here we have the creator of Gantt. He has said that Gantt is pretty much reaching the end of life in favor of Gradle. Am I correct to say that? Yes, we will eventually move to Grail. Uh, we might be back on, on the job done by Grail, so maybe we might do it in our own way. Uh, we will definitely like to do it just because for the sake of resolving the dependencies. They, we, 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 we may get some other facilities as, uh, or other features such as their performance or caching during the build time, but we'll definitely move to, to Grail at some point. Yes. Is 
Yeah, Gradle requires a bit more dependencies uh, on the build time, but uh, I guess uh, overall it will see a, it will still be a very good move. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. I think that the GVM downloads go directly to the same link that, go, uh, that is posted by Bintray. Yeah, of course, sad, th these, these artifacts are also posted to the uh, Codecast Maven repository, which is mirrored by the uh, central Maven repository, which is also mirrored by J Bintray's J Center. We cannot count those downloads. So we definitely have more downloads than we have seen. The, those ones are only counting the Binary distribution, the zip file, and the tar, uh, yeah, and the tarball as well. So those are pretty good. Well, so I think that's pretty much what I have for you guys. Thank you very much. Continue enjoying the conference. Again, let me remember there are some stickers and some uh, pins for you, and I think that the T-shirt goes for you, Mister. Thank you.